Hey everybody, welcome to the vermicomposting or worm composting webinar. My name is Tia Silvesi and I'm the Florida Friendly Landscaping Agent with the University of Florida in Orange County. So welcome everybody and today you're going to learn maybe some more advanced stuff about composting, uh, maybe some basic stuff, but um, either way this is a great practice to do in your yard. This webinar is brought to you by the Victory Garden Program, and um, Aaron will put a link how to join that in the chat. And this is a great time to join if you're not already part of our free program, because in Florida, especially, the fall vegetable gardening season is just about to start here. We're at the end of August, and prime time is September, October. So now is a great time to join our program and hop on board our vegetable gardening adventure. And uh, we also have a book club on how to grow more vegetables that we're starting this Friday. So check out the Facebook page and you can see that event, which is also free. So in case you're not familiar with Florida Friendly Landscaping, it's guided by nine principles that help you to make more environmentally sound decisions in your landscape. And principle number one is the overarching principle, right plant, right place. And this basically means if you have the right plant that is suited for your location, your climate, the soil moisture, then it will just thrive and really you will have to not do a lot to it. Very low maintenance. Whereas if you have the wrong plant, then you might have pest problems, disease problems, you might have to constantly trim it from hitting your roof, and it's a lot more work. So we want less work, which is more sustainable, and eventually, you know, trees and shrubs should be able to kind of take care of themselves, just like they do in the natural forest. So the worm composting class, this falls under principle number seven, which is to recycle yard waste. And there's many ways to do this. So this is just another tool that you can add to your toolbox of recycling yard waste. So here's the basic worm composting setup. And um, the bin pictured on the right, that is a can o worms bin, and that's what I have um, under my house. I just left the lid off so you could see the paper, but usually I keep the lid on. And so if you wanna get started with worm composting, um, these are the things that you'll need. You're gonna need uh, special worms. So they're not the earthworms that you dig out of the ground, they are some type of red or blue wiggler composting worms. And these naturally live like in the surface layers and sometimes they eat manure or leaf litter or the organic matter right there. Those usually cost about $20 per pound and you can get with a local worm supplier and have them shipped you know, directly to your house in a little cardboard box overnight and you can get your worm bin started. Um, so the bin pictured here um, is a man-made worm bin. Um, it's made from recycled plastic. It comes with the lid and the three layers and then the bottom layer which catches the water. And those run about $100. So I would recommend one of those bins. Um, you can make your own too out of plastic Tupperwares that you buy from a big box store. Um, you're also going to need some type of worm grit to help with their digestion. So you could buy a special worm grit, which is basically rock dust, or you can just crush up eggshells. And so I put that $30 in parenthesis because that's optional if you want to do that. I get it for my worms and I'll go into that more later. Um, you're also going to need paper bedding. So this is one of the good parts about worms because if you're trying to work towards uh, composting absolutely everything in your house and be sustainable then the worms are the best way to recycle your paper so paper comes from trees and it will turn into soil so just rip it up make sure you remove any plastic and they need that bedding kind of like in a normal compost pile 
above and below where the food is. So you're making a food sandwich with paper as bedding on the bottom and top. They like a special diet, kind of like a raw vegan diet. Um, they can take cooked food and stuff fine, but they, they love like fresh fruits and vegetables, especially watermelon rind, they love it. You'll need some water, um, non-chlorinated water is preferred. So rain water or let it sit. If you have city water, well water is fine. And then you'll need like a little bucket or bowl, like I have this um, silver bowl here to collect the worm tea. And you want to keep it in a shady, cool spot, uh, maybe under cover or under a tree where it doesn't get like the pounding rain. Um, definitely want to keep it in the shade, especially in Florida. Now, if you're joining us from Canada or somewhere up north, you might have to worry about it getting too cold in the winter. In Florida, we don't have that problem. Um, so maybe you can put it in a protected area. And um, in Florida, we actually have to worry about it getting too hot in the summer. So I don't, I don't do anything other than keep it in the shade. But some people who really like to baby their worms, they'll put in iced like water bottles that have been in the freezer into the worm bin just to bring the temperature down a little bit into their favorite range. So the total cost you're looking at, you know, 100 to $150. Um, you can just start with a cardboard box and get a handful of worms from your neighbor and start your bin that way and then eventually build up to something bigger. There's many ways to do it. Um, as a more professional gardener type of person, I like this system because it's very efficient and it's durable. And I've had this worm bin for at least 10 years. So here's some... Um, Ways you can make your own worm bin. If you don't want to buy the $100 one, you can buy a couple of these blue or whatever color Tupperware containers and you want to drill holes in it. That way the worms can go in and out the different layers. And then um, you can collect the, the worm tea in the bottom layer or maybe put a spigot on it somehow and put the lid on it. So that's fine to do it that way. And again, I said you can just use a cardboard box to start anything to contain them. Um, they don't live in the normal compost pile in your ground. They don't live in the ground. So do keep them in some kind of worm bin. Um, the problem I find with these is they are not UV resistant. And so they end up kind of cracking or breaking within a couple years. And it's also hard to configure like the little spigot to um, collect the worm tea out of. So I'll briefly talk about the benefits of worm composting. Um, I really love the worm compost system in addition to my regular compost pile because I can recycle all my kitchen scraps very efficiently, um, all my paper products and my, um, some of my yard waste, most of that I put in the regular compost bin. But this produces one of the high, highest quality kind of soil amendments and fertilizers that you can buy. So it doesn't necessarily have a high like nitrogen compost, but like other composts, um, it's beneficial microbes. It has a lot of those and all the organic matter. So it really helps with nutrient availability. Also the worms, um, they have bacteria and enzymes in their system. So they basically are inoculating all the soil with those beneficial microbes and enzymes. Um, it's low maintenance. Like I said, you can go for vacation for a month and not worry about it. It's small and contained. So this is ideal for people who live in uh, apartments or you have a little patio on the back or uh, just a small space, you know, you don't want your dog going through it or worry about raccoons and stuff. And this is a really good way to work towards zero waste. So I have one of these um, egg cartons pictured here. And so this is something that you might normally just throw in the recycle bin, but these things, all these little paper products and your paper towel rolls and your toilet paper rolls and even your junk mail, just remove the plastic part of it. You can just rip these up into little pieces and put these in your worm bin as bedding. 
So um, on my Facebook channel, I have a whole video about how you can recycle all these paper products and make soil out of it. So that's how you can recycle more of your um, paper and work towards zero waste. So with worm composting or regular composting, um, compost is just a foundation for any good garden, especially here in Florida. We have such sandy and poor soil. Um, you can really not add too much compost. Just keep adding it and adding it. Um, so it adds a small amount of nutrients. It increases nutrient availability by the like soil chemistry, how the nutrients want to bind to the organic matter. Also, the water wants to bind to the organic matter. So it increases the water holding capacity. Um, it attracts and provides food for beneficial microbes. And this has long lasting benefits. So over many, many years, these organic molecules will still be slowly releasing and assisting in improving the soil structure. So you're not gonna get, I mean, you still will get instant results. You'll see your plants look great, but it also provides results over the long term. So just some challenges um, about the worm bin. You have to be careful for other bugs. Um, in Florida here, I get a lot of soldier fly larvae, like the little maggot looking things. And those are okay, they're also decomposers. Um, so I just have to be careful not to feed it too much at one time. Sometimes I'll get little snails in there too. So that's something to look out for. Um, the worms are sensitive to high and low temperatures. They're kind of like humans. They like air conditioning, like between 70 and 85 degrees. If it gets very cold, below freezing, they can freeze. If it gets really hot, um, then they can kind of burn and they'll want to crawl out of the bin if it gets you know, above 95 degrees. So it also can be a little messy, like the, the worm bin suppliers, they advertise, oh, you can just keep this under your kitchen sink, which is true, you can, because it doesn't smell or anything, but just sometimes there might be a little something leak out of it. So if you are gonna keep it indoors, I would recommend to put like a little tray or something underneath it, just in case you have some little drips running down the leg or something. Um, so these are all easy to deal with challenges and, you know, just like organic gardening, I learned to live with a little bit of soldier fly or snails in the worm bin. So don't freak out if you just have a couple little bugs because you are putting some delicious food scraps in there that all kinds of bugs are going to want to eat. If you do get like an ant problem or something, um, you can put little water cups under each of the legs and that will prevent the ants from being able to get up into the worm bin. So let's get into it now. Composting worms are specific worms. So they're epigeic worms, which means they live in the surface of the earth. They are not earthworms. They do not burrow down into the soil. So a lot of people get confused about this and just go dig up some worms and put them in the bin. That does not work. Um, these worms are domesticated and naturalized and you can sometimes find them in nature. Um, I don't find them in nature too much in Florida, but um, when I lived in Hawaii, I did find the Indian blue worm in a pig pen just in the manure. So there's three types of worms that are probably um, commercially available for you to buy. The, the, wed, the red wiggler um, and the tiger worm for Florida. And then if you live in the tropics like Hawaii or Puerto Rico, then you'll probably be using the Perionyx excavatus, which is the Indian blue worm. And that one actually has a little bit of blue iridescent to it. So, um, make sure you use composting worms and these are the three common species and if you buy them from a uh you know worm supplier like um composting worm supplier you'll be sure to get the right one and they'll usually list on their website which species that they give you 
So worms can eat their weight every day. So if you buy a uh, one pound of worms to start your worm bin out, then you can put in seven pounds per week. Um, I might put like half that amount so I don't get um, bug problems and stuff. But the more you feed the worms, the more they reproduce. If they know there's plenty of food and extra food, they will internally know, all right, there's so much food we can reproduce and we can make babies. So if you're trying to increase your population, then feed them more. So just a little bit about worm biology. And um, this is a little bit technical. I have the diagram there at the top courtesy of Merriam-Webster, but um, worms have no ears, no eyes, arms, or legs, but they have both sex organs, and they breathe through their skin. Um, they have two to five pairs of hearts, and they're cold-blooded, and then they produce three to four cocoons per week with the 83% hatch rate, and the cocoons um, it takes about 30 to 75 days for the three worms to emerge per cocoon. So this is an important fact here because when you have your finished worm compost, you, you have to know that a one to two and a half months, there still could be baby worms coming out of your finished worm compost from those cocoons. And so once they hatch, the eggs become adult worms and they can reproduce in about five months. So those are just some kind of fun facts for you, but um, in the actual worm bin, you know, you just let them, let them be and feed them food and you'll be all good. So that's what most of the presentation is about. So let's get moving on here to the worm food. So like I said, their favorite is a raw vegan diet. So I eat mostly vegetarian, so this works out pretty good for me. Me and the worms, we get along. They're great pets. Um, they love like banana peels, apple cores, lettuce, kale, um, juice pulp, if you have a juicer, or if you go to your local like Smoothie King or something, or maybe they have some juice stuff there. Um, watermelon rind, I think, is their favorite food. Just like we love watermelon on a hot summer day, so do the worms. And if you put a little bigger piece in, you will see them make a pile of worms on top of that watermelon. It's really cool to see. Um, vegetable parts, like with your tops of your carrots or your hearts of your lettuce. Pineapple rinds, they like that too. Papaya, the fleshy part. Um, coffee grinds and filter, you can put tea bags in there. Um, eggshells, they do like eggshells, although they are slow to break down. So when you harvest the finished castings, you will still see bits of eggshells in there. And um, eggshells are also good because they provide grit and they help the worm digest and break down the other food. So be careful with bread and grains like rice um, because this can attract the, the bugs like the soldier fly larva. Um, so it's okay in small amounts, but usually I put that in my big compost pile in the yard. Also onions and citrus, they don't really like the onions and citrus. They don't like to eat it it's too tough. So it's okay to put it in small amounts like half a lime or something. And if you can cut it up finely, then that's good for the worms. Because remember, they don't have any teeth. So what I do at my house is I have a Tupperware container and I keep it in my freezer. And as I cook my meals, I'll put my food scraps in there. And if I have something like this watermelon, I'll just give it a couple extra chops with my chef knife and then I'll throw it into the Tupperware that I put in the freezer. And then I usually feed the worms uh, once a week, unless I just cut up a whole watermelon, then I'll feed it all that day. 
Um, so you can feed them, you know, as often or once a week or once every other week as you want, you know, it's just more work. So I, I kind of like to keep things low maintenance. And so the once a week works good for me. Just when, if you have your compost in the freezer, maybe take it out and let it thaw for an hour or two. So it's not frozen when you put it into the worm bin. Because that, the, if you, you touch the worms with the frozen food, it could kind of freeze them. You don't want that to happen. So here's some things not to put in. Papaya seeds. Papaya seeds make worms sterile. So I learned this in Hawaii. And so, you know, just it's a fun fact to know. Um, if you put a couple in there, it's not going to make your whole population sterile or anything. But don't put a lot of papaya seeds in your worm bin. Um, don't put meat. Don't put dairy. No, no heavy oils. Um, you know, occasionally I'll have a couple shrimps for dinner and I'll put the shrimp tails in the worm bin and they all disintegrated. No problem. I'm sure they can use some of that for grit. But you don't want to put this stuff in your worm bin. It's better to put it in your, your regular compost pile or just dispose of it in your trash. Um, meat and dairy, they can, you know, harbor some uh, harmful pathogens. So you have to be careful with them. So let's talk next about the bedding. So this is kind of another food source because the worms eventually eat all of the bedding and it will all turn into like soil looking worm castings. So you wanna have some uh, good mix of carbon materials. I probably use like 80 to 90% newspaper in my bin because it's free. And you can see the little picture on the bottom, how I rip the newspaper. So there's kind of an art to that. So you wanna take it where the folded part is and just rip straight down and it will make nice little strips. If you try to rip from the other side, it won't wanna make nice little strips and it will just come off in chunks. So there's kind of a little art to ripping the newspaper. Um, you can also buy coconut core and like some of the worm bins, I know the one that I got from Our Vital Earth, they come with a chunk of coconut core to get you started in the worm bin. Um, coconut core is awesome. And if I was rich, I would probably use like a lot more of it. But, you know, I'm still trying to save money for retirement. So I just use a little bit of coconut core because it is a little bit expensive. You can use cardboard. Um, like your old pizza boxes that they don't recycle because they have a little bit of oil on that. Well, the worms don't care about that. Just rip it up. Um, sometimes if you soak it in water first, it's easier to rip up. Um, if you have a shredder, a paper shredder at your home or your office, that's great to use. Um, the paper nowadays, you don't have to worry about like the heavy metals on the ink. Um, most of the inks now are soy based, but I still would not recommend like the glossy paper or saturated with um, ink kind of paper. You do be careful of if people added plastic to your paper shredder. Sometimes people shred credit cards or if you get like the junk mail, the little window, sometimes people will shred that too. Well, you're gonna have to pick all that out later because it's not biodegradable and it will be in there. So be very careful not to put any plastic in your paper shredder. Tell your, tell your husband or your wife or your office mates if you wanna use it for your worms. Um, soft leaves, like I don't put so much oak leaves or mango leaves or hard leaves in there, but I do use some soft leaves, like some fresher stuff. Um, papaya stems, it gets real stringy with the little holes in it, corn cobs. These are also good carbonaceous materials um, that you can use in your worm bedding. And so when you feed them once a week, you also want to put a fresh layer of bedding on the top. The next thing is worm grit. So we mentioned that worms need a little bit of grit because they have gizzards instead of teeth. So kind of like chicken gizzards. So they use the gizzards to kind of, they rub together um, and break down the food. 
And so um, I add one handful of rock dust, which is this worm grit per month. I've seen other people that add one handful per six months, but um, it's just like a little sprinkle on the top and it's, it's not very much to me. Um, I get one bag of this for like 30 bucks and it lasts me pretty much a whole year. So the worms need this grit fire digestion and then it also adds minerals to the finished products. Um, this, this product that I have, the worm grit, it contains 77 to 94 trace elements um, and it's made from volcanic rock dust. So you can buy rock dust, you can buy azomite, and you can also use eggshells. And the more that you crush them, the better. Although sometimes I just put mine in whole and then crush them as I go along. Um, but some people like barbecue their eggshells and then crush them up in the, the coffee grinder or with a mortar or pestle, but that's just too much work for me. But if you wanna grind your eggshells, then they'll be better and for the worms. You also need to water them once a week. Um, so my weekly program is I'll keep the compost in the freezer, I'll get some newspaper and then water and I'll do it all one time, you know, on my Saturday morning or something. And then I just let them be for the rest of the week. Um, so you want to use rainwater or well water. You don't want to use chlorinated water. Um, if you do have chlorinated water, maybe put it in your watering can and let it sit overnight for that chlorine to dissipate and then water them once a week and just kind of like you're giving them a shower. Um, it's kind of uh, not too much, not too little, but you don't want the water to be pouring out of the bottom, but I usually water so that it does start to drip out of the bottom, which you don't see immediately because it has to go through the layers. So here's the finished product. So worm castings, and if you have kids, you can call it worm poop because it's what comes out of the worm. So if you're starting from scratch, if you just got a brand new worm bin and you have your worms and you have the paper and you're adding to it, um, it will take about three months to produce, kind of like a normal compost. And you'll know it's ready because all of the materials will be broken down. This is assuming that you're doing the layered method with a multi-layered bin. Um, but once you get in the cycle, if you have the three bins, then you can be harvesting castings every month. So um, I actually have two bins and I might get two harvests once a month. So plenty of worm castings to add to my potting soil and soil. And then again, the castings contain beneficial bacteria and enzymes from the worm's gut because these bacteria and enzymes, they help the worm break down the food and then they end up in the finished compost. So this can be an inoculant, you know, for your regular compost pile, this will put the beneficial bacteria into your soil. Um, it does have a low nutrient analysis. So some people call it fertilizer, like in this um, picture here on the right, it says organic fertilizer. However, the analysis of the NPK, the one zero zero, that is a very low analysis. And so you can't expect to um, produce a huge tomato harvest off of only using, you know, worm castings. You probably need to supplement with some fertilizer, but some of the vegetables, you know, like beans or lettuce, um, you can probably get away with only using organic compost like um, worm castings for fertilizer. And so, but remember, you're building the soil, and if you're adding the grit and stuff, then you're gonna be adding all these trace minerals and micronutrients, and it will have long-lasting effects on making other nutrients available from the soil and inoculating your soil with the microbes, which will also help with um, nutrient absorption for your plants. So you can't always just, um, look at the number, oh, 1% nitrogen, you know, well, that's not a lot. So here's some tips for harvesting worm casting. This is my method 
that I do. I see a lot of people struggle with this and they want to dump out their whole worm bin onto a plastic tarp and then sort out the castings from the worms. I am way too busy for that and I don't think it's good for the worms either. So this is the, the lazy man's approach to separating the worms from the finished castings. So what you're seeing here is my worm bin that has finished castings. So this layer was at the very bottom. So you start with, a, say you just bought your worm bin, you're adding to it, you're adding the paper, and then you put on the next layer one month later. And then you add to that, add to that, and then you do the third layer one month later, and you're adding to that. So at that point, your bottom layer then should be finished, finished compost, no recognizable paper or food products. Um, you might see some peach pits or avocado pits or something in there, but that's, that's standard. They don't break down very quick. You also see some eggshells or if you had some like pine bark or something in there. Um, so you take the bottom layer and you bring that to the top and then stir it often and expose it to sunlight because these worms, they don't like sunlight. It will make them crawl down and stirring actually kind of like tickles the worms and makes them go down. And then don't water it. You want to let it dry out and help it to dry out and get less heavy by adding some light fluffy material to it. And this is where I use the coconut core. So that lighter brown stuff on top of the picture is coconut core. And I'll mix that, you know, I'll kind of spread it over the top and then I'll mix it in a little bit. Um, the worms, they don't like the dry material, so they will go away from it but don't mix it in too much that you're drying it out too fast. Like let them over time, like a couple weeks, let them crawl down to the more favorable conditions where you're feeding the food. You will now be feeding the active layer will be right under this one. And so when you go to feed it and um, water and add the paper, you'll have to lift these finished castings away and then feed your active layer and then put this layer back on and usually i stir it um, before i remove it to feed the layer before because every time you stir it you're chasing the worms down to the layer below and after you do this you know i'll do this quite often like every couple days i'll mix it and maybe add a little extra coconut core and um, say over two weeks after you mix it like five times, there should be hardly any worms in here. Um, the last time I did this, I just handpicked out about 10 worms when I was adding it into my potting mix. So that's my um, great method, a little worm hack for how to get the worms separated. If you have any more questions on that, you know, you can ask me later or when you get to it, when you're ready to harvest, feel free to email me at that point. So after you harvest, then you're on to cleaning and resetting the bin. So you want to spray it out. I have this little jet blaster hose and see all the little holes. Make sure you spray out the holes because you want the worms to go up and down between the different bins. And so give it a good spray on the inside and the outside. And then um, you can start this again as your top layer and put your um, carbon materials, your newspaper, your worm bedding, and then your layer of food, and then your next layer of bedding. And um, then you're ready to go. That's, that's kind of like the three month process there. So next we're gonna talk about uses for the worm castings. So um, pictured here on the right is my worm bin, which is completely decomposed. All you can see is a little bit of eggshells and some pine bark that somehow got in there. And so I normally don't sift it, but in this case, I wanted to use it for starting my fall vegetable garden seeds, like tomato seeds. Um, so I did want to sift it. 
but um, you can add it to your potting mix. It's recommended up to 20% in volume for your potting mix. You can also top dress your planted um, stuff in a pot, like uh, the top of the pot, just mix it into the top of the soil or your um, lawn or your landscape plants. If you have a favorite plant, you can kind of side or top dress by putting the castings around. Um, if you're starting your veggie garden, you can mix into your veggie garden. Now be mindful that the worm bin does not reach hot temperatures. We hopefully won't have it over 90 degrees. And so there still may be some tomato seeds or something that sprout out of the worm compost. So when you're mixing it into your veggie garden and then you see a bunch of tomatoes pop up, like don't worry, that's fine. You can just weed them out or let them grow. And know that the ultraviolet light, it kills the beneficial microbes. So don't just add the worm castings to the top of the soil and walk away. Um, if you can mix it into the soil or kind of cover with whatever kind of mulch that you're using in your garden, then that would be ideal. So next we're going to talk about worm tea. And I'm not going to spend too much time on this. It's a kind of complicated subject and there's, there's still some research being done. But um, some people call it worm tea. It's kind of like worm pee too because worms poop and pee. And when you give them the little bath with the watering can, you know, it will rinse all that stuff off of them. So the worms need uh, a regular bath, you know, a weekly shower. If you go on vacation, it's okay if um, you don't shower them that week. But it's also called leachate because it's what's kind of seeping or seepage out of the worm bin. And this is the can of worms pictured here that I have. And you can see they have the spigot on the bottom that it will come out. So the worm bin has the three layers and then the bottom layer is um, where the water can be held. Now I usually keep my spigot open so it doesn't um, keep a lot of water in there and then I just collect it in the little silver bucket and water my plants with it. But um, we jokingly say, oh, this is a three-story condo complete with a swimming pool, you know, so only the best for our worms. Um, so you want to use it fresh. So after you water it, um, your weekly watering, then you'll collect the worm tea at the bottom and you want to use that fresh. You don't want to like let it sit around for a long time because it may turn anaerobic. And so if it smells bad, then it's turned anaerobic and it may contain anaerobic bacteria that aren't good for your plant. So, you know, just dump it out somewhere like on your lawn or not on your favorite orchid, you know what I'm saying? So if you wanted to make real worm tea, um, which I usually don't do this because it's too much work for me, but um, what you want to do is you want to take the fresh castings, like the worm poop, and get one pound of castings and 10 gallons of water and put it in a little baggie. So one pound is about three cups. So like you could put it in a sock or a pantyhose or a fine mesh bag and tie it with a string to hold it together. Add uh, one tablespoon of molasses or sugar, which will feed and reproduce the microbes. And then use like an aquarium bubbler in, uh, in a five gallon bucket. You can do five, two five gallon buckets. And so you bubble it and let it sit, um, you know, with aeration for 24 hours. And then as soon as you're done with that 24 hour of aeration, then use it immediately as a soil drench, water it into your soil around your plants, or you can spray it on the leaves, um, just like you would normal compost tea. But again, you don't want to hold it beyond um, this time. If it takes you longer than 24 hours, keep the bubbler on it. That way it doesn't turn anaerobic. So we want aerobic um, compost, aerobic warm tea. And so um, this, is, this is good to do. I personally don't do it because of the intense of work, intensity of work required. But if, um, if you want to wake up and make some tea and then put it on your plants the next day, then 
that's great. You know, well, your plants will love it. So if you're not going to make the, um, the bubble stuff and spray it or put it on your plants, just the normal worm tea that you get at the bottom, you can add it to your watering can. You can dilute it with water or use it straight. Um, and you can use it to fertilize on your plants. If, if you have a lot of it, um, and like it's summertime now and nothing needs watered, then just dump it on your bananas. That's what I do. You can also recycle it in the worm bin. Use that to water the worm bin. And if you're putting in some new shredded newspaper, you can soak that bedding paper in the worm tea, especially when you're making the brand new layer, because that will give them some of their good juices and stuff that will make them feel more comfortable. Um, you can also use it to soak seeds, like large seeds, like bean seeds or something to help them germinate quicker. And so um, just a word about harmful pathogens. So organic waste and compost may contain pathogens. So just practice normal sanitation and wash your hands after handling the worms, after handling the food waste and the compost. Um, that's basic for even normal soil can have harmful pathogens in it. So wash your hands after gardening. And a couple um, frequently asked questions like, so how are worms different than regular composting? Well, worms just require a couple little tweaks in the care. They like their food chopped up smaller, the big stuff you can put in the big compost pile. Um, they have a little bit more restrictive of the diet. They prefer the fruits and the vegetables. Um, whereas you can put more bread and stuff like that in your regular compost pin. And a regular compost pile heats up. Um, when you're adding all the materials in that large volume, then the compost bin will heat up and we don't heat up our worm bin. So don't take your worms and put them into your compost pile and think they're going to help it break down because they'll probably just die or crawl away. Okay, so the compost bin, you know, that's where I'll put like, you know, if I'm making corn on the cob for dinner, all those corn husks. And if I have a, a lot of eggshells, you know, I'll put onions in there, bread, you know, a little bit meat or dairy, the papaya seeds, again, compost meat and dairy with caution. Um, you know, the things that don't break down too, the peach pits, the avocado seeds, the mango seeds, the corn husks. You know, if I have 12 people over for a barbecue, I'm not going to put all of those in the worm bin. I might put a couple in the worm bin. And then the bigger leaves, the oak leaves, the mango leaves, the stuff that doesn't like to break down so easily, and the huge stuff too, like the banana stalks. You know, they're just not practical to go in a little worm bin because they're, they're humongous. So what if I go on vacation? I love to go on vacation, especially to tropical islands. And so I don't worry about my worms when I'm gone. What I do is I feed them pretty much a normal serving, you know, maybe a little extra, and then I'll give them lots of extra bedding because they'll eat that bedding. It's like a backup food source and it will keep their temperature um, regulated. It will help to keep them moist too. So give them a good, watering make sure everything is thoroughly wet and then put the lid on and you're you're pretty good for one month if you're going to go away longer than that you will want to have um, your neighbor or somebody come and check on your worms but they are very forgiving um, i've seen people really abuse their worm bins and neglect it for six months at a time and if you still have a little pocket of worms surviving somewhere in there, you can revitalize your worm bin. If all the worms died, then just start over and, and get your mail order of a uh, fresh batch of worms and start over. So I just wanted to tell you how extra special worms are. Um, you know, as we go into the future and we have problems in our urban areas with wastes or heavy metals. So worms, um, they can actually be used in bioremediation. So if you take compost and garbage that has heavy metals in it, 
then through the process of the worm digesting the organic material, the worms will take out the um, heavy metals and something in their body, it kind of makes the ions different to release and break up the chemical chains of these heavy metals. So um, you can read more about that in the Science Daily article and many other articles online. Um, fungus are the other thing that can help in bioremediation. So growing mushrooms, they can break down these heavy metal chemical chains. So just a fun fact for you, hopefully you don't have any toxic waste in your backyard you're trying to clean out. So wrapping up here, um, we have uh, Sarasota County for UF IFAS did a great um, little handout on worm composting. You can just Google UF IFAS and download that. Also this book here, Worms Eat My Garbage, is really cute and fun. It's great for kids. And um, you know, it just talks about the basics like I covered today in the book. That's by Mary Applehoff. And then our link here to join our Victory Garden program. Erin also put that in the chat box for you. And then you can follow my Facebook, um, Garden Florida, UF IFAS Extension Orange County. And I have a couple videos there about worm bins and how to feed your worms, how to, how to rip up the paper and feed it to them. And so I really appreciate y'all coming today to learn about worms. And this is a way that you can get your own worms. Um, I'm not, I just put a couple places I know in Orlando are Vital Earth and also Revival Gardening. But um, if you're shopping for worms, you can, you know, buy the bins and stuff on Amazon. I would try to get the worms more local to you, as local to you as possible, because they will have to ship them overnight to you. And so um, if anybody else knows where to buy like the red wiggler composting worms, please let us know in the chat box and I can add it to my presentation in the future. And um, that concludes my presentation. So if you want to scan the QR code here with your smartphone, you can take our survey, which helps us provide these free programs to you. And again, my contact info is at the bottom, tsilvesi at ufl.edu. And I'll be happy to take any questions at this time. Thank you everybody for coming. Tia, we have had several questions and a lot of great um, just comments in the, the comment box as well. So the first question is, are red wigglers the same as bait worms, uh, the ones that you buy at like the fishing store? Um, that is a kind of confusing question because they do call those red wigglers, but sometimes they're night crawlers. The composting worms are very small, very small and not good at all for fishing. So I wouldn't buy the composting worms that we use in the worm compost at a fishing store because they're probably not the right kind. No fisherman in his right mind would use one of these small composting worms for fishing. So just go to a worm supplier that provides composting worms. Perfect. What's the ambient temperature for shade, for the shade? Um, ambient temperature for shade, it kind of depends. Like where, where I keep my bin, you know, it's like 70 to 85. It's a good temperature range, but it depends on, you know, what, what climate zone you're in and what, what part of the world you're living in and how shady is your shade. Is it just like an oak tree or is it an elm tree? But just general shade is, is pretty good. If you see the worms crawl, trying to crawl out of your bin and escape, then it might be too hot for them. And if you're worried about the heat, then you can try putting in some of the um, frozen water bottles. Okay. Uh, what was the name of the worm bin you bought? Um, I have two. One is called the Can O Worms, and the other one is the Worm Cafe. It's more like a square type. There's also the Worm Factory. Um, all of the commercial ones that have the multi layers are good, uh, quality made, and I would recommend that over 
trying to put a couple Tupperware bins together. But if you're on a low budget, then start with a cardboard box or a Tupperware bin and, you know, look for a free worm bin on Craigslist. Okay. The ink on the paper doesn't it bother them. They're, they're talking about like um, newspapers or mail or um, even from magazines. Right. Most of the ink nowadays is soy based ink it comes from soybeans. So it is biodegradable and it doesn't hurt the worms. But I would avoid like uh, super heavy colorful stuff like I don't put in the glossy part of the newspaper. I only put in the newspapery stuff and avoid anything that's kind of wax coated or like full color just because it takes longer to break down. Okay. How to keep snails and slugs away from the bins? Um, well, if you have a problem with the snails and slugs, um, you can put a little cup under the feet of the worm bin. That way they have to like crawl through a water in order to crawl up the legs of your bin. So I find that works well for ants and other creatures. Okay. Can you add lime dust to make the smell uh, or to help the smell or will it affect the worms? Um, I'm not sure about the lime dust. I would think that maybe in really small amounts, but um, you probably wouldn't do one handful a month of that because it would probably be too much. So I would stick with the rock dust. All of, all of the reputable worm sites talk about rock dust or azomite or eggshells as the tried and true. Um, if maggots get into the bed, how do you get them out? Maggots are probably my biggest problem in the worm bin and um, the maggots are most likely the soldier fly larvae. So it's like a little black fly and they, they're decomposers. Some people breed the soldier fly larvae maggots to like um, eat their food waste and then they feed them to their chickens as like feed. But the best way to get those, well, prevent them from coming in is to back down on the feeding a little bit and make sure you use lots of bedding to like cover up the smell of the fresh food. Once they're in there, eventually they will hatch and fly out. But other than that, um, you can pick them out by hand, which I do a little bit of from time to time. Um, that's kind of one of the things I've just learned to live with you know, so I don't have to do a lot of work. Um, I could do more research and see if there's a better way to, you know, exclude them. Maybe if you had it in a indoor area, they wouldn't be, ex you know, so available to come into the bin or not. But um, that that is one of something that I deal with and I just kind of manage it by not feeding it so much and adding more bedding and, picking a couple out if they get to be too many. They also like bread and stuff a lot. So don't add any bread if you have the maggot problem. Okay. Um, so now we're talking about that blue plastic bin. Um, somebody said it looked like it was filled to the top. Um, if you're making your own worm bin, you want it similar to like the pictures I had of the multi-stacking. So they kind of rest into each other and there's some space for you to add the worm bedding and food. So the the final layer could be more like, you know, the top active layer could be more filled to the top, but the lower layers, you will run it so that the bins can rest on each other. Okay. Is there any concern of releasing these worms in the environment? So if you don't get them out when you, um, you know, harvest? Yeah, no, there are not concerns of that. Um, these worms, they, I read an article about, um, they kind of like follow people around and eat their waste. And so they're kind of already naturalized and like domesticated in all over the world. If they do escape from your worm bin, um, they might find their way to the edges of your compost pile where it's cooler, or um, they will maybe die because your outside environment is not conducive to their habitat. So that's nothing to worry about. Will fine sand work as a grit replacement? Um, fine sand, 
I'm not sure about that. I, I usually hear people using the rock dust or the azomite or the eggshells. So um, I'm not sure if the sand will work. Okay. Do you pick the eggs out of the castings by hand? So when you're harvesting the castings? No, I don't worry about the eggshells. Like they slowly biodegrade and um, whatever I put the castings into like my potted plants or my vegetable garden, they'll just continue to biodegrade out there. Okay. Can you add the worm castings to the compost pile? Um, yeah, you can, but that would just be kind of wasteful. Okay. I think you might as well just, because it's already finished, so you might as well just add it to your plants. Does the leachate need to be diluted before adding the plants? Usually not. Usually I add it straight. If, if you make it concentrated um, by dumping it over and over and over into the worm bin, then you might want to dilute it. Um, and you can also dilute it to make it go further. But um, no, you don't really need to dilute it. Okay. Uh, three more questions. Do corn husk act more like bedding in the worm bin? Um, corn husk is kind of like a little toy for the worms. Like they'll crawl around in the hollow part in the middle and in and out of it. So yeah, they, they can act as bedding, but um, you might need to chop them up finely or um, to spread them around. I wouldn't just put like a bunch of whole corn husks in there. Okay. I would also add paper. Going back to the egg question, sorry, um, she, she clarified. Do you pick the worm eggs out of the castings before adding to the plants? Oh, the worm eggs. No, that's, that's they're too tiny to really like want to pick out. But the method that I do to separate the worms from the finished compost, it takes some time. And so that kind of allows some more worm eggs to hatch and move down into the next layer. So I don't specifically pick them out, but I use this slow method, adding the coconut core and drying it out. And so that lets some of the worms go. And then a couple of them, you know, will hatch later in my potting soil or something. And if I find a worm in there, I'll just put it back into the worm bin. Okay. Is adding composted manure beneficial? Um, adding composted manure. So after the manure has sat around, uh, manure is kind of a sensitive issue. I know for the organic gardening certification, um, they want it to be kind of like hot composted or composted over some time. So um, I'm not sure about that. Are, do you know, Erin? I don't know, no. And I think this person means after it's been composted. Mm -hmm. So like it's, already, it's already been hot composted and then added. Yeah, um, to me, I, I, that's another finished product that you could just add straight to your lawn or landscape or vegetable garden. So there's not much point in like adding it to the worm bin. Okay. Two more questions. Do you start with any soil or just carbon materials? I usually don't put regular soil in the worm bin. You could put like a handful of soil or something, but they really aren't soil dwellers. They, they like, um, you know, the paper bedding and then the cut up food scraps. So okay. usually no soil. And then should you wash and dry eggshells before adding in the bed? It depends how particular you are. Um, I personally don't, but it's probably you know, if you read the health safety things, eggshells can contain a little bit of salmonella. So you can wash them, dry them, grind them up, you know, toast them a little bit. That will help them break down more. So it's up to your own personal preference. Okay. Uh, let's see. Is the cold weather season in Florida an issue at all? Well, depending what part of Florida you live in, if we are going to get a freeze like under 32 degrees, then uh, what you can do is add extra bedding. You can also add extra food because when the food breaks down, it produces heat. So give them a hearty meal that night and it will help keep the worm bin warm and that should be good enough. Okay. I think that was everybody. <laughs>
Okay. I, I just reposted the um, survey to complete at the end. Also, if you um, want to join the Facebook group, you, you do need to register for the Victory 2020 Garden Program first. And then I also put the link to the videos where we put all of these um, out. And uh, somebody asked for the PowerPoints. We're working on that for all of these presentations, actually. So you guys have access to that. So um, you should get an email about that, too. So. Great. Well, thanks for co-hosting with me today, Erin, and thanks everybody for attending. Have a great day. Thanks, Tia. Thank you, everybody. Bye.